into the study. <clears throat> what must I do to be saved? And today I want to talk about the offense of the cross. Jude's urgent warning to contend for the faith is a call to the modern church to remain true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. From the beginning, there have been those who have questioned, attempted to undermine the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who have tried to bend and reshape and altogether redefine the gospel to conform to the current prevailing cultural and social, and then to redefine what it means to be a Christian. Consequently, when Scripture speaks of a departure from the faith, which is going to occur in these end times, and the end times began, began when Jesus returned to the Father and birthed the church. We're in those end times. And the scripture says that our, our, our time, our salvation is shorter now than when we began. But a departure from the faith is really a departure from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not so much what we see being built on top of these foundations, but it's the very foundation itself in which folks are departing from. How did we get there? Well, back in the 50s, the term evangelical referred to churches the church's fervor had an all-consuming desire to preach the gospel, to tell people about the wrath of God, to flee the wrath of God. But beginning in the 70s and moving forward, the church started placing a lot more emphasis on incorporating marketing strategies into its evangelistic efforts in order to find out what people really wanted and then use that statistical data to reshape the gospel to satisfy the needs of the crowd. That needs soaking in because it tells us how we got where we are. It's been progressive and methodical and intentional. In other words, with the insurgence, uh, the, with, with, with the increase of, of media, television, there also came an assault on Christianity where every picture of a pastor was this long nose, skinny guy with his fists screaming at people and it, and it created a negative impact on people that they didn't realize. And so all of the evangelistic efforts that were going on during the 50s where uh, folks were kind of sharing and people were receiving the gospel, that began to dwindle down. And so the church looked for a reason. What's going on? And they concluded that you could not speak about hell. You could not speak about the wrath of God. You could not talk about sin. You could not talk about judgment. You could not talk about hellfire. And people stay in your church. And so they used statistics to go out or pollsters to go out and survey people and see what do people want? What is it about church they don't like? And come to find out the very thing they didn't like were the fundamentals of what the gospel is. And so they said, if, so, so the church got wise and said, well, what we need to do is the gospel so that it fits into what the people want to hear. And then after we get them saved, then we'll kind of tell them what the gospel is. 
It's kind of coming in at the back door. I've said it for years. I'll continue to say it. What you bring them in on is what, you, what you're going to keep them with. And if you give them a diminished gospel, you can't bring them in and then start talking about sin and judgment of God and they stay. Because that ain't what they came for. They didn't come to get their sins forgiven. They came because they wanted a lollipop gospel. You know what a lollipop gospel is, don't you? You know, after you, you take a lollipop, stick it in your mouth for a while, it dissolves. And all you're left with is a stick. Amen? And wanting another lollipop. And quickly you throw the stick away. And that's a, that's, a, that's a gospel that will not save. It is a gospel that will not keep people. It is a gospel that the survey said people, people don't want to hear, but they, they prefer this lollipop. The candy man is the preacher handing out a lollipop gospel. Out of that then came this uncertainty over the years, an uncertainty about what the gospel is, because then the gospel discontinued to be preached, the biblical uh, version, that is, of the gospel, the only one that will save us. And so that it created this uncertainty, and so then there was an argument about, well, you know, what we're doing is we're making a division between what's essential and what's non-essential. Because then that would provide a basis for our fellowship. So we don't have to worry about those things that are non-essential as long as we believe what is the essentials. Well, we change what is the essential. But here's the problem. Everything in here is essential. <laughs> Can you see how this marketing strategy has come to, to actually... Make the Bible obsolete. Make the preaching of the word obsolete. And with this uncertainty, also people stopped going out and sharing Christ because they weren't sure of what the gospel was anymore. And so they felt, they felt ill-equipped to go out and share because after all, the, you know, this church, they preach this, God, this, this is what you need. And these guys, they're preaching something different. So there came this uncertainty. And so nobody's out really preaching the gospel anymore. The other result of that uncertainty is, is that the pulpits then uh, were demanded, don't be too rigid. You know, the, the, the biblical preaching became hard preaching. Whereas in the 50s, people came to hear biblical preaching, and guess what? People were getting saved. In the revivals, people preached uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and people came in groves. A revival didn't last one week. Revivals back in, if you read about them, they lasted five and ten years. That's a long time. We don't see that today. Why? Because we're still going to the pollsters to figure out what people and go on the pulpit. And so if we say that there's an absolute truth from the pulpit now, folks are saying, well, no, I don't agree with that. And they feel comfortable in it. They feel quite comfortable, but you can't tell me that. And we're comfortable in that. How did that happen? We started a marketing strategy that said, if you don't cater to people, your church is going to dry up. And so now today we have, as a result of marketing strategy, not because of biblical preaching, we have the mega church. And we got more candy man preachers handing out lollipop gospels and more people believing in, in something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. R.C. Sproul said this, and I, I like it. He said, what's worse, we almost expect the minister 
if he is to be politically correct to say, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that. I'm not sure. If the pulpit ain't sure, it ought to get sure. And so, though that's kind of a long introduction into this offense of the cross, the offense of the cross sits right at the root of what the gospel is. And when the cross is taken out of the gospel, I'm here to tell you something. You got a lollipop. And you're going to end up with a stick with nothing on it that you will quickly discard. Because that which once satisfied won't satisfy it any longer because the candy's gone. Amen? So I want to talk to us a little bit this morning and tonight about the offense of the cross because if there's no cross... There's absolutely no gospel. If there's no cross, there's no gospel. The offense, then, of the cross. Why is the cross, and the scripture says that the cross is offensive. It's an offense to some. Why does it say that? I want to submit to you several reasons. There may be many, but I think they will all fall under the umbrella of one of these, these reasons why the cross has become what it is. The number one reason why the cross is an offense is because it awakens the conscious to sin and the dread of judgment. People do not want anybody to talk about sin because once we start talking about sin and judgment, there's another word that is coming to, to being over this uh, uh, beginning in the 70s, judgmental. Don't be judgmental. That's a nice way to say, I'm going to stay in my sin and don't you say nothing about it. The church is here to tell people all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in some cases, as the Bible says, not as the preacher has this pet peeve or his pet little sin he wants to erect and, and throw out, but as the scripture says, it lists that all these things will not enter the kingdom of God. These, these things are not going to enter. Why? Because they bear symptoms of an abiding sin in that individual. You see, it's not the, the fornication or the adultery or the idolatry, the pedophilia, the murder. Those are all symptoms of something wrong inside called sin, unbelief. Amen? And so when you start getting into uh, talking about sin, people... people People push back in their hearts. That's where they do it. They, they push back and that little, that little curtain goes down over their eyes. And, and the only thing they can see is how much more time before I can get out of here. Because I don't want to hear about sin. Why? Because we've been programmed over the years. We've been programmed to a lollipop gospel. And so the cross doesn't fit into that. The cross, however, expresses what? God's zero tolerance for sin. People don't like that. Christians don't like that. <laughs> Amen? Let alone the loss. But the Bible says what? The cross convicts the soul of sin. No one stands before the cross innocent. No one can stand before the cross and not recognize what that means. No one can do that. It doesn't mean they accept it. It simply means they cannot stand there and look at that and not ask the question why. And God has given them the answer inside of themselves. And besides, John 16 says that, doesn't it? 
When the Holy Ghost has come, what's he going to do? He's going to convict the sin. He says the cross convicts the soul of righteousness. That my righteousness only comes through the cross. See, somebody got to take care of my sin first. Somebody's got to make a way. See, I, even, at, even when I accept Jesus Christ, that doesn't make me righteous. He is righteous. If I'm in him, then his righteousness becomes my righteousness, but I am not righteous. It's his righteousness. And therefore, I submit my will to his will. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I that we might be what? Made the righteousness, watch it, of. Of means it came from somewhere other than yourself. So that we might be made the righteousness of God. In, meaning I'm in Christ. Are you with me here? The cross convicts the soul of judgment. Of judgment. <laughs> no one stands before the cross who does not ask that question. Why? For your and my sins... That's why. For what the law could not do, in other words, my self-efforts. Because it was weak, because of the flesh, God did, listen to this, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. God's got a zero tolerance, amen? That bothers people. Because that means that there will not ever be one sin that is not paid for. Not a single one. Somebody's going to pay for it. And when I look at the cross, it echoes God's word, Jesus' words when he, when, when he was teaching the disciples, all sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. When I look at the cross, it's the only way I get that message driven down in my heart because I know that God will not bypass a single sin in my life. But I sin, but he died for. He died for let me tell you something, friends. There's no goody two-shoes in here today. And there's no goody two-shoes in any church that is open today under the name of Jesus Christ. It is His righteousness. We're a bunch of bad people trying to learn how to live good. We, we need to recognize that. Amen? Christ died, says 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. 1 Corinthians, Romans 8 and 32 says, He did not spare His own Son, son but delivered Him over for us all. He, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If God looked on Jesus, the perfect man, the perfect man, the man who knew no sin, the man who kept the law perfectly, only man ever to, to do it, no one ever convinced him of sin, even the trial that condemned him to death, had to declare, I find no fault with this man at least four times. At least four times. Expressively. Amen? This man, if, if God would pour out his wrath on that man, where in the world do you and I stand? If we reject, if we neglect so great a salvation, where do we stand? 
He didn't spare his son. Why? Because when he looked at his son, he saw our sins. Wow. He saw our sins. And God cannot look on sin with any kind of favor at all. He always looks on sin with anger and wrath. And he poured it out on his son. And so people are offended by the cross because it reminds them of their sins and reminds them that God will bypass no man, no woman. Sin. He won't do it. Every sin will be paid for. It has been paid for on the cross for those who've accepted Jesus Christ. Amen? But it will be paid for if we reject Jesus, then the only person to pay for that sin is the individual. And that's an eternity. Because ain't none of us got what it takes to pay for it. And so it is an eternal separation from God. And so people become offended by that. Who do you think you are to judge me? And they don't realize that that anger is coming from the very fact that the Word of God has hit them right in the gut. And they are resisting and pushing back on that revelation. Trying to make themselves something they're not. The cross then expresses God's zero tolerance for sin. He he just doesn't have any tolerance whatsoever. A second reason the cross is offensive is because it confronts pride head on. Amen? It confronts pride head on. Pride is the father of sin. Let me say that again. Pride is the father of sin. Pride exalts exalts a a person. Pride makes a person think, uh, you know, I'm in control. Pride says, I can live my life the way I want to live my life and everything's going to be all right. Pride makes one look at God and say, hey, look here. I will not have that man you sent, Jesus Christ, to reign over my life. That's what pride does. And the cross confronts that pride. And it confronts it head on. Sin, the scripture tells us, what is of the devil. And the devil, he has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God appeared for what purpose? To destroy the works of the devil. Pride caused the devil to be thrown out of heaven. Why? Because there was nothing in heaven that was imperfect. There was nothing there where the devil could look on and say, that's an example that I'm following. Can you imagine? Every example around him was a good one. And so if pride came, it could only come out of an invention of a corrupted mind. And so here's how it works, you know. We, we can dissect this thing, but it's instantaneous, really. You see, pride corrupts, and corrupt brings out pride, and in pride, there's sin. That, we can't dissect that and make it happen here, here, here. It happens instantaneously. It's the only thing the devil ever created. Sin. The only thing he ever he ever fathered, if you will, is sin. You know, in the garden, the, uh, the serpent was, above all things, he was trying to instill in Eve pride. That's what he wanted to do. He says, you, you can be God's. Choose for yourselves what is good and what is evil. You, you can do that. God, God knows if, if, if he's trying to keep something from you. What's he really trying to do? He didn't tell them to disobey God. He wanted to instill in them 
pride that would cause them to question God. They hadn't questioned God up to that point. God had blessed them to that point. There was nothing in the garden that would have indicated or shown an example of any rebellion against God up to that point. God had richly blessed them. And so he says, if I can get them, if I can instill this pride in them, I've won the game. I've won the game. Because after that, pride will take over and sin will be produced. Sin will be the result of that prideful heart. Amen? And so, in other, uh, um, in other words, the devil says, you don't have to follow the word of God, the pattern that God has for your life. you got enough sense to do it yourself. you got enough common sense to do that. You really, you know, he's, he's instilling those thoughts. And, and so the scripture says that Eve kind of, she, she looked at it and said, well, yeah, there's something to that. She had to contemplate. She had to think about it first. She had to compare what he said and what God said. And in her mind, what, what the devil said made sense. And pride swelled up in her. And the scripture says she did eat. And then after she eat, ate, she called her husband who was standing there and gave to him. He did not protect her. You know, in the scripture, it says that the woman is to keep silent in the church. Amen. I'm not going to go off on that tangent, so don't let your mind go too far there. I'm just trying to make a point. Well, here's, here's Adam. When he should have opened his mouth, he should have been silent. When she should have been silent, she had opened her mouth. And he reversed the order. And when the order was reversed, sin came into the world. And what was the sin? Pride. Pride. So the cross is offensive to those also. Excuse me. Pride turns the soul itself to a place of self-sufficiency. Self-reliance. Nothing so thoroughly contaminates the soul like pride. Nothing. Nothing. Deceives the heart, the scripture tells us, more than simple pride. And the cross confronts that pride. Because it says, you are not who you say you are. You are a sinner undone. That's who you are. That's what the cross does. And people say, no, I'm not. I know how to run my life. I know what's best for me. I know what's best in my house. I know what's best for my children. No, you don't. God does. And so people see the cross as an offense and the heart backs off on that and says, well, well who are you? I'm nobody. I have no right to impose anything as a man on anyone but the cross. That's what it says. And because it says that, some get offended. It swells a person up. And pride has a circular motion. The mouth speaks and the only one that hears is the ear. And so it keeps, it's like a, a bicycle pump. Words just keep coming in and pumping and pumping and pumping. Well, let me tell you something. Pouring yourself into yourself adds nothing to yourself. Amen? Pouring yourself into yourself adds nothing, has no benefit whatsoever. Paul said, I have no confidence in myself. My confidence in, is in God. Well, what did Paul mean? He, means, he meant that God had given him extraordinary talents and extraordinary gifts. He was a smart man. He was, he was a, a, a man, what we would call today a type A type guy. He was, he was just 
full force ahead type of fellow. He, give Paul a job, he get it done. But Paul was saying, if all of that is in me, God put it there, I'd better use it to his glory. He never said, I have confidence in myself. If God put that there, then he's put it there for his glory. The cross reminds us of that, amen? Because we all want some glory, don't we? <laughs> we do. We want a little glory. We want to puff ourselves up. We don't want to seem like we're too bad. We might have even said it. I'm not that bad. Why? Because you're puffing yourself up and the only person that hears is your own ears. <laughs> amen? Because the person you're talking to has just recognized, don't say nothing else. <laughs> you see, that person don't know who they are. And if we said it, then we don't know who we are. Nothing brings clarity to both the love of God and the wrath of God and the sinfulness of man like the cross. It's all right there. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. What was he talking about? The cross. The cross. Let people come to the cross. Let them see what the cross can do for them. A third thing, and maybe this one is more important than the ones we just said. The third reason why people find that the cross is offensive to so many is because of its exclusivity. It rejects all other means or ways to the Father. Exclusivity. That there is no other way. It leaves no room for any other religion whatsoever. We fight tooth and nail today to say that all religions are the same. They are not. And I'm talking about in what is called the Christian community. You see, when we, when we lump Mormonism in as a Christian religion, we got a problem, don't we? We got a real problem. But some people don't like anybody to say that. They want that uncertainty. Why? Because uncertainty means, well, maybe they're right. Well, I will only say maybe they're right if I don't know what is right. Amen? If I don't know what's right, then I'm going to be open to whatever else is out there because I'm, this is where, why we don't preach the gospel. Because we're not sure we're right. I'm here to tell you, friends, the cross is right. The gospel in its fullest is right. And anyone who preaches it, I don't care what flag they're raising outside in terms of a denominational sense, the, the cross is always right. The death of Jesus Christ, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, his ascension to heaven who sits on the right hand of God right now, who has promised to come back in judgment is right. And anyone who does not believe that is wrong. I don't have to fight with them to tell them it's wrong, but I need to know I'm right. And when you're right, just be happy in your rightness. Because the scripture tells us point blank, do not cast your pearls before swine. There's some people you got to write off. There's some people you don't need to pray for. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Having said that, I, I, I actually need to explain that, at least we misapply it. A person may reject Christ. You and I did. You and I didn't accept Christ the first time somebody came and laid the cross before us, told us about our sins. We didn't, we didn't accept Christ, but we didn't absolutely reject him either. It got us to thinking, perhaps, but we did not accept him. But later on, we were wooed by God. Somebody else came, and then we moved, and boy, there's another one over here. 
It seemed like God was chasing us down. Wherever we went, somebody talking about this Jesus and his death and his resurrection and his sitting on the right hand of God and his promise to come back in judgment. Every time I turn around, somebody's talking to me about that. God's chasing me down. I'd better slow down. Amen. I'd better slow down. But there's a person who tramples the cross of Christ. Who pokes fun at the blood of Jesus. That's casting pearls before a swine. It's different when someone has not come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, has not come to the knowledge of repentance in Christ Jesus. That's a different animal there. And we ought to keep telling them about Jesus and to the capacity that they can receive it. Understanding that maybe many will follow after us. I may not be the one to bring that person to Christ. Maybe a year down the road, two years, five years, somebody else might do it. But the one that tramples the blood of Jesus, that's the cross. Pokes fun at it. He says that's casting pearls before a swine. That's the person you do not pray for and you do not bring the gospel to. Jesus told his disciples when you go out, you knock on that door. If the peace of God is there, you go in. But if the peace of God does not rest in that house, you wipe your feet off as a judgment against them. Don't cast your pearls before a swine. And we need to pray for that kind of discernment. You nor I nor anyone else has the capacity to make that decision. Amen? But I can tell you how it kind of happens. All of a sudden, the fire is gone. And the testimony out of their mouth says, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Go where God's working, because if he's not working there and you stay there, they'll never get saved if God ain't working. Amen? Because their salvation is not based on me. It's based on his calling and his drawing. Amen? His grace and His mercy. And because uh, the, 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 the cross claims exclusive rights to the Father, many oppose it. Folks say, well, what, what's wrong with those who think that uh, we need to uh, deify Mary? Well, Mary didn't go to the cross for you. But Mary can help us get to Christ. When Mary and her brothers came to Jesus when he was talking to a crowd of folks and the message got up to Jesus and said, hey, your mother and your brothers are out there and they, they want to see you. You know what Jesus said? <laughs> these, are my, these are my mother. And my, this is my mother. This is my brother. He said, those that follow me and my family. Amen. He wasn't dishonoring her, but he was letting her know you have no privilege in this work that I'm doing. You do not call me out. You do not call me down from my father's business. Amen. Are you with me here, church? Jesus says, Mary can't help you get saved. Because Mary did not go to the cross. Mary did not believe. Mary, though she did believe for conception, didn't believe. Are you with me? But all of that doesn't matter. She didn't go to the cross. Amen. And she doesn't have uh, Christ's ear. You see, and then we, we've come to say, well, it doesn't matter. See what I'm talking about, that uncertainty in the intro? 
This uncertainty, well, maybe, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. What do you mean you don't see anything wrong with it? Of course you don't see anything wrong with it because you're not looking at the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't include Mary or anybody else. If you take anything away from the gospel, you add anything to the gospel, it's wrong. It's wrong. And when you preach that way, some people are offended. Amen? And it's called, well, that's just hard preaching. We need some good, solid, hard preaching. What is hard preaching but what the Bible calls bold preaching? What is bold preaching but preaching the Bible as the Bible is written? That's bold. It is not the volume that says it's bold. Bold says, I'm not going to draw back. As Paul says, I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. I'm not going to hold anything back from you. That's bold preaching. That's looking into their eyes and not letting them shut you down. Because they don't want to hear what you got to say. That's bold preaching. Paul prayed, give me the boldness. We need some courage. We need courage in our pulpits. We need courage in the pew. People are dying because they're not hearing the gospel, not so much that they hate God. And we've got to take it to them, not this lollipop gospel preached by some candy man preacher. We've got to tell them. You see, we wouldn't grab a hold of somebody on the street with the passion that I may exhibit today. I'm not saying that. But God told Jeremiah there's a time that if you're going you're gonna to drive that nail into some hard wood, you need a hammer. You can't be hitting on that nail with no noodle. And because we've become hardened to the very gospel that will save people, sometimes we've got to drill it, not in the hearts of those out there who are lost, but into the very people of God who will sit and listen and quietly be offended Offended. That's too harsh, Pastor. How can I invite my friends here with you preaching that way? Ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you hear me? I can't invite my friends. You know, Pastor, be, boy, he'd be just drilling down. and I better not invite him here. Why not? Unless I'm offended by the gospel. And you see, we've come that way. It's trickled in. That's what was handed to us some way, way back yonder, and we didn't have enough sense to know it at the time. We didn't recognize it at the time. We just took it and ran with it because we didn't hear anything different. But we hear something different today. Paul said, I claim to know nothing among you. I claim to know nothing among you except what? The cross. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because without the crucifixion, there's no forgiveness. Without the crucifixion, there's no hope for a new life. Without the crucifixion, the wrath of God hangs on every single human being. Aren't we concerned about our loved ones? Aren't we concerned about our friends? Well, I don't want to get them all mad at me. Get them mad at something. I'd rather them be mad at me and I tried than have to face God and him asking me, why didn't you tell them? Don't come up here weeping because they went to hell. I sent you to tell them. Why didn't you tell them? You think that won't happen? You need to read Ezekiel. 
God told Ezekiel, hey, look at here, guy. I'm going to send you to a people whose head is like flint. Whether they hear or they don't hear, you need to bring the gospel. Now listen to me, Mr. Ezekiel. If I tell you to go and, and preach the gospel, turn from their unrighteousness, preach the gospel, turn from their, their uh, iniquities, and you don't go, they will die in their sins. And I will hold you accountable. That's offensive to some people because they don't want that kind of load on them. God put it there. I didn't. He says, however, if you go and say to them, turn, turn ye. And they don't hear, they will die in their sins Oh, but you've redeemed yourself. We cannot slough off our responsibility to receive, receive the gospel. It is the gospel that saved us. If we have not received this gospel and you're sitting in here this morning, you're lost. That's hard preaching, Christ. That's the truth, uh, George. That's the truth. That's the truth. God wants to get our attention to say, listen, this is the, the real gospel. This is the starting point. You can have no good news until your sin's been washed away. And I, I sent you the Lamb of God, my son, who takes away the sin of the world. Not only your sins, but the sins of the whole world. Are you here? People get offended when Jesus says, I am the way. He says, I'm not pointing to you and saying, hey, look at here. I've got this little map. Now, if you follow the map, you'll get there. You see? You, you follow the map and you can find your own way there. Just follow the map. That's not what he means by I am the way. He says, I am am if you are in me you're on the way I will carry you there because you cannot carry yourself there you have to be in me for in me is the hope of glory in me you are complete in me and no man that is not, any man that is not in me will be cast away. It's pretty tough to say. I love my family members. I love my friends. But I cow down when it comes to sharing the gospel with them. Something's wrong with that picture. It makes everything we're doing here Null and void. Amen? God's not just trying to clean us up to look pretty. He's trying to make us fit and suitable so that he can say to someone, look at Adrian, look at Madge, look at John. Look at, look, that's what Jesus looks like. Oh, I can't make myself look like him. I don't want nobody to be like me. I don't want anybody to be like me. I want them to be like Jesus. And so Jesus says, I want to conform you into the image of my son so that I can tell people that's what Jesus looks like. So that when I share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they can see in my life that I don't live in sin. Amen? 
They can see in my life a humility and that my righteousness, I'm quick to say, there's nothing good in me. My righteousness comes from Him. They can see in me the work that God has done and, and be attracted to Him, not me. We've, we've, we've swapped evangelism for proselyting. Proselyting makes people like me. Evangelism makes people like Christ. And I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. We look today, and I said it on the intro about this evangelistic, or this word evangel. Today we don't even know what that word means. We have no idea if somebody say, are you evangelical? Do you go to an evangelical church? We kind of look at them with that uncertainty. I think so, because we don't know what it means. Well, I'll tell you what it means. Today, evangelical means a conservative political position. It has absolutely nothing to do with bringing people to Christ it says we are a political group. We've got some clout and we're going to legislate this Bible. And Jesus said you can't get in that way. It's through the cross. It's through the cross. That's how we get in. Huh. Church, church, church. God is trying to break some things down in us. He's saying, you know, we just can't keep doing the same thing and honestly think everything's all right. We've got to start growing up. We got to start, we got to start standing up. At some point in time, we've got to take responsibility for our own faith. To where somebody's not always begging you, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. That's what we do with children. But at some point, you, you, you understand, I don't need to come to the table with dirty hands. Amen? At some point in time, I, 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 I learn because I had a parent to keep telling me, go wash your hands and also get your wrists. Hands clean and put mud around the. <laughs> Go take a bath. At some point, as we mature and we grow up and understand, if we don't take a bath, nobody wants to be around us. Church, we need to grow up. God has given us a great responsibility. Ooh, too often you, we look at what's going on up here and we, we say, Pastor, that's your job. No, my job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's my job. That's what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. My, my job is to do no more than that. The assumption is, is that I want to do the ministry of God. You see? Wow. The cross cannot be at all diminished or limited or taken away or eliminated from the gospel and it has any power to save we cannot just say to people all you got to do is believe believe what what do I need to believe well you just need to believe Jesus who is Jesus He's the Jesus, the entry point 
into salvation is the cross. Amen. So I got to start with sin and how God has dealt with the sins of man. He did that at the cross. I got to start there because a person doesn't need to be saved from nothing. That's a crazy man who runs and nobody's chasing him. Amen? And so that individual's fight is with God. And Hebrew says it is a horrible, horrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. I cannot look in the face of my friends. I cannot look in the face of my family members and tell them I love them. Knowing that if they don't accept Jesus Christ as the scripture says, they will die and they will spend an eternity in hell. Amen. I'm not sure why I make so many notes and then never preach them. But you've heard enough this morning to say believers in Jesus, those who are blood-bought, it's past time. God is not going to save a soul simply because you and I get on our knees and pray. Somebody is going to have to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to that individual. Somebody's praying somewhere for somebody in the circles every one of us walk. And God has put you and me in those people's paths. And the only way those people are going to get saved if one of us goes to them and tells them about the cross. That's the entry level. Don't tell them about God loves you. You got to tell them about sin first. And he loved you enough to remove that sin. Do you see that? Because if you start with love first, then they, they define what love is. When you start with sin first, they become unlovable. And they need some loving. That's when you tell them God loves you. Are you all with me today? Listen, church, I could just go on and on and on. I'm so full as I begin to recognize that we've lost our taste for evangelism. And that we've lost it because we've lost our understanding of what the gospel really is. Amen. And so I implore you, I plead with us, wherever you're at, maybe this morning is a time that we can spend with the Lord and start to get things lined back up to where he can start using us. It starts with simple repentance, doesn't it? That's where it starts. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, let me just tell you something. Now is the day. Now is the day. If what you have heard today is the first time you've ever heard this, you have just heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, God reaching out to you, wanting to save you today. What are you waiting for? It will never get any clearer. And God is not going to change his mind as, as in terms of the requirement. There's nobody in here, in this place, this morning, that God is not talking to. No one. How dare you say in your heart, I wish someone else was here. No, you need to hear. And you need to respond. Amen? I'm going to have you stay seated. And I'm going to close out 
praying that God will use this word this morning to move on your heart. When I'm finished and you stand up, you don't have to come to the altar. But by coming, you say to yourself and nobody else, Lord, I am not going to stay where I am in life anymore. I'm starting anew with you today. Some of y'all need to do that. Otherwise, I've missed this whole thing. And I'm just preaching to the walls. Bow your heads with me. Lord,